Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. Thanks so much for tuning in. If you're new here, welcome. If you've been here before, you already know how much I love and appreciate all your support. I love you guys and thanks so much for being a part of this little family that I've built around me. My name is Dana Trupiana and every week I cover a new infamous gangster in a true crime-like format. Today, I'm going to be talking about one of the major organized crime figures in Detroit, Michigan. I'm doing this because it's a fan request. We Are Venom has requested multiple times that I do somebody from the Detroit Syndicate, so we're going to do that today. He's also from the Prohibition era, so it's going to be around the time of Lucky Luciano, Al Capone, all the majors. He's also credited with helping establish one of Brooklyn's early crime-based families in New York City, the Castella Marisi clan, which is better known today as the Bonanno crime family. Gaspar Malazzo, who's also known as the Peacemaker, will be who we're talking about today. Gaspar Malazzo was born on April 25th, 1887 in Castella Mare del Golfo, Sicily, to Vincenzo Malazzo and Camilla Pizzo. Super interesting, but Malazzo and I are birthday twins. One kind of downfall about having my birthday is that April 25th is a date that's mentioned in Miss Congeniality. They ask the supermodel when she's on stage, she's at like a Miss America contest, and they ask her what her ideal date is. And they're looking for an answer like, oh, my ideal date is walking on a beach at sunset, holding hands, but they don't get that. She turns around and says, April 25th, because it's not too hot, it's not too cold, all you need is a light spring jacket. So, because they say that in Miss Congeniality, every year on my birthday, everybody posts on my Facebook, or I know I'm dating myself here, but on my MySpace, and they put the little meme of the girl saying April 25th, and they put the whole quote there, and they say happy birthday. So obviously, Malaza was born way before that movie, so he didn't get the memes, but I get the memes, so, you know, yay. There's not really a lot of information out there about Malazzo's educational background or anything about any schooling that he may have had. I'm sure that he did have schooling. Every kid has schooling. But he did grow up in Sicily, so Sicily didn't really have very good record keeping, so we have no idea where it was that he went to elementary school or high school or if he dropped out in fifth grade. We have no idea. Malazzo immigrated to the United States in 1911, and he settled in Brooklyn, New York when he was 24 years old, which is probably because New York is where the ship comes in at Ellis Island. And it's not exactly easy to travel at that time, so immigrants during that time, they usually come into New York and they settle somewhere in New York at first, and they spend some time there, and they just wait it out, and eventually they hear through word of mouth that there's an area that is heavy with people from their area, and then they'll head there. But until they hear people talking about an area that they should go, they just kind of settle into New York, and that's why you'll see such a high concentration of Italian immigrants in New York. So Malazzo settles in Brooklyn, and he stays there for a while, and he starts to become a member of the Castella Marisi clan, and starts running crimes from there. How do I know that he's running crimes? Well, because he's arrested multiple times, and when he got arrested, he would use fake names. He would tell the police that his name is Gaspar Lombardo, or Gaspar Shiblia, which is his wife's last name, so he would use that as a fake to try to get them to not associate it with him himself. Because, like, how are you going to prove that it's not him? It's not like they have technology that you can do, like, a fingerprint scanner at the time in 
1911. You can't really prove otherwise unless somebody knows him in the police station. If he says his name is Gaspar Lombardo, guess what? His name's Gaspar Lombardo. He married Rosaria Shabibig, who ran an Italian grocery store, and they had four children together. I searched the internet high and low because I could not find these children's names, and I still haven't been able to find these children's names. And that means that their children didn't go into the mafia, which is always a great thing to see. I do know that all four children were had within a seven-year period, so they had their last kid when their oldest kid was seven years old. I guess they misspelled his wife's last name when she arrived at Ellis Island because her name is Shablia, but her immigration paperwork says that her name is Shabibig. So someone didn't understand her when she was spelling her last name and they got stuck on the I-B. So she ended up with a whole new last name. I wonder if my last name is supposed to be the same thing or it's supposed to be something else. I always wondered that because if you search my last name, nothing comes up. Not one person on social media has my last name. And I would assume that some kind of family back in Italy, I would have to have some kind of family. It doesn't make any sense. I didn't just come out of nowhere. Not one person on social media has my last name. So I think the only thing that could have happened is when my grandmother came into Ellis Island from Italy or from Sicily, that she had to have given her name and they didn't understand it and they misspelled it. And then now there's some random family in Italy that I have that are related to me and I'll never know it because they gave my grandmother a different last name. So when you Google my last name, you can't find that family. I know you can run those like ancestry things, but right before she died, my mom ran one of those and it legit didn't go any further back than my grandmother, the one that immigrated from Sicily. So there's no record of our family in Sicily. So if she did it already and she didn't find anything, I really don't feel the need to do it again. She used Ancestry.com. Funny story, my mom's family and my dad's family were each on the news on separate occasions because they found some long lost sibling. My mom's family, they found a daughter that her mother had given up when she gave birth like way before she had the rest of her kids and she ended up having eight kids and she kept those eight kids but the one that she had, the daughter that she had was like way before that, like 10, 15 years before that. So when she ran her ancestry thing, that long lost sister came up. That's not how she found her. She had already known about her from when I was a kid and she was on the news. But when this random person came up, she had no idea who it was and she reached out and she's like, oh, it's me. So it was like a little weird. That was like the big discovery that she made of family that she didn't know she had, but she did know that that was her family already. So it wasn't some big discovery. And then my dad, he and his sisters found a long lost brother that his father had that they never knew about because his father left the family when he was really young. So that's one of the funny little things that my parents had in common. They stayed married and happy until the day that my mom died. So like that was 30 years or so. So those guys took till death do us part like literally. When he arrived in New York, he quickly established himself within Brooklyn's Sicilian underground community and also within the community itself. Him being involved quickly in the underworld means that he was probably heavily involved in the mafia back in Sicily. We can't see his criminal history in Sicily because, again, not the greatest record keeping. And because it was so long ago and they didn't exactly have like digital records at the time. But you don't just arrive in America at the age of 24 years old and immediately get hooked up in the Mafia unless you were already evolved in Italy. It, do it just doesn't happen. He really wanted to succeed in America, and this inspired him to surround himself with a group of friends and a lot of friends from Castella Mare del Golfo and from the Castella Marisi Mafia who were highly motivated and ambitious just like he was. So, you know, he just, he wasn't trying to be friends with no bums. If you were like, 
lazy and wanted to lay on your couch. That's just not the kind of person that he wanted to have in his life. It made sense that Malazzo was a member of the family that's now known as the Bonanno family because Stefano Magadino was his cousin, which means that Joseph Bonanno was his cousin, or at the very least, his second cousin. Because, like, if I have a cousin that's a daughter of my mother's brother, and she has a cousin that's the daughter of her mother's brother, that cousin would be my second cousin. So I'm not really sure if they're from the same side of the family, but at the very least, they're second cousins, and that's why they're in the same crime family together. By the late 1910s, Malazzo was known pretty well as a top member of the Casella Marisi clan, which had its headquarters in Brooklyn, thanks to his ambition and his drive and his criminal prowess. Like, he was fully on board for any crimes that anybody was pulling off. He heard about a robbery, he's like, I'm in, I'm there, I will help. And he was really good at it. So he became a top contender in the underworld. Gaspar Malazzo was involved in the traditional mafia rackets of gambling, extortion, loan sharking, bootlegging, anything that you think when you think mafia, that's what Malazzo's involved in. Even though he's involved in all these crimes, he doesn't have a lengthy criminal career made by like a lot of arrests, even though that's pretty common among all the other gangsters and mafia members, he was able to evade arrest a lot. Obviously, that doesn't mean that he's not doing a shit ton of crimes. It just means that he's really good at it, so he doesn't get caught a lot. And a lot of people respect him, so they don't drop his name when they go down or flip. It also could just mean that not a lot of people around him flipped in the first place. Life became a lot easier for him because he and his group of Castella Marisi mafiosi, they made sure that they secured enough of these connections that Malazzo himself never faced or like experienced any serious charges or convictions that could have resulted in serious jail time. I also don't see anything about him being involved in narcotics trafficking, and that has a lot to do with why he wouldn't be going to jail for a long period of time, because honestly, narcotics trafficking trafficking, that's where a lot of jail time comes. If you get caught gambling or illegal gambling, you'll go to jail for like a year or two. If you get caught narcotics trafficking, you go to jail for 10-15. So because he wasn't really involved in the narcotics trafficking, it kept him out of jail. Also, because a lot of the really successful mafiosi, they understood the value of the connections within the criminal underworld, and also because he had so many connections to corrupt law enforcement agents and politicians. In other words, if a cop heard his name from a rat, he didn't hear his name because he had so many connections. They're like, yeah, no, we're not messing with that dude. <laughs> I don't know. I, he never said that. Did you hear him say that? I didn't hear him say that. Nope. Malazzo's leadership qualities, his toughness, and his ability to mediate disputes amongst other gangsters made him a very well-respected and feared member of the New York Mafia. By the time Prohibition came about, Malazzo was considered a very senior member of Brooklyn's Castella Marisi clan, even though he was really young. He was only probably, what, 30? And he's considered a senior member. Obviously, his associate and cousin, Stefano Magadino, was also a very important character. He would be a future leader of the Brooklyn clan, and then when he relocated to Buffalo, he became the boss of the Buffalo clan. As well as Joseph Bonanno, the patriarch of New York's Bonanno crime family, which is obviously one of the five crime families. And that's his cousin, so he's got a lot of really big heavyweights on his side. He was able to earn credibility from Joseph Bonanno because they got really close. And when he wrote his autobiography in 1983, A Man of Honor, he wrote that Gaspar Malazzo and his cousin Stefano Magadino were really important men in the Brooklyn-based Castella Marisi clan. So because he had so much respect from Joseph Bonanno, 
that catapulted his reputation within the crime family. You know, like if you heard the name Gaspar Malazzo, it was like, oh, okay. Like people stopped and they started to listen because they had so much respect for him. Along with other leaders like Vito Bonventre and Nicola Cola Shiro, the Brooklyn-based group ran and controlled a number of criminal activities that included gambling rackets, like crap games, the Italian lottery and numbers rackets, money laundering, money lending, better known as loan sharking, or nowadays cash advances, the extortion of business owners in the Italian community, and a fair share of the bootlegging in Brooklyn and other parts of New York. But the Castello Morisi clan, they had competitors and rivals in the other four families that formed in the city in other areas over the decades. And after the Castello Morisi war, there was no boss of bosses. There was just the commission. So even though they have rivals and competitors, they all had to get along because the commission together made any decisions within the New York underworld. So it was important that everybody got along. And even if that's someone that you hate, you don't go to war with them. You just bite your tongue and get through whatever time you have to be in the same room as that person. Before Malazzo and Magadino had immigrated to America from Sicily, they had been close associates in Castella Mer del Golfo. And members of the Bonanno Magadino Bonventre clan a strong and well-known mafia family back in their hometown, which saw a number of its members and families emigrate to various parts of America, and a lot of them went to Brooklyn, New York. So you saw a pretty large presence of this family in Brooklyn. I'm pretty sure that nowadays the Bonanno family is more heavily on Long Island. I want to say, I'm not 100% sure about that, but I want to say that a pretty decent portion of the Bonanno family is on Long Island, New York now. It might be the Genovese family. I might be wrong about that, but I do want to say that a pretty heavy portion of them nowadays are on Long Island, so. Mm. Malazzo and Magadino's clan had previously been involved in a blood feud or a vendetta with another really powerful and well-known Castella Marisi mafia family, the Bucciolato family or the Bucciolato clan, which also had members who emigrated to various parts of America, including Brooklyn, New York, implying that the blood feud would continue outside of Sicily. So like the war in Sicily was so serious that it was pretty clear that no matter what happened, even if they came to America and a whole bunch of time passed, they would still hate each other. They would still be at war. There would still be bad blood between the two groups. Malazzo and Magadino pretty heavily believed that the Bucciolato clan members had killed Pietro Magadino, Stefano's brother, back in Sicily in 1916. Magadino had lost his life in the ruthless mafia war that had now spread to American soil. The apparent murder of Pietro, a member of the Bucciolato clan, had eventually immigrated to America. Word was sent from Sicily to Malazzo and Magadino to alert them of the arrival of Camilla Cayozzo, who, sure enough, was spotted by a member of the Malazzo Magadino inner circle, which would later come to be known as the Good Killers for their efficiency in killing their enemies and then disposing of the corpses without getting caught. In the summer of 1921, Malazzo and Magadino were allegedly allegedly able to convince, in all actuality, threaten a friend of Keozo's into setting him up and murdering him because Keozo is the one that they believed killed Pietro Magadino. The murder took place in Avon, New Jersey, where the killer or the hitman, Bartolo Fontano, a low-level criminal, had taken Keozo to see about investing money in a brothel apparently. You know, like, he obviously that's not really what he was doing. He wasn't really bringing him to a brothel and looking into investing in it. He was bringing him to be killed. And pretty much they were like, all right, listen, either you're going to get Kyoto to come and we're going to take care of him, or we're going to take care of you right here and now. So make your choice. And the guy was like, all right, I'll get him. I promise. So 
that was the end of the line for Kaotso. The two men later went hunting where Fontana shot and killed Kaotso. So I don't know what would make him think that hunting would be a good idea. Like, oh yeah, let's go out into the middle of the woods with guns where nobody can hear you when you have beef with, like, the most powerful figures in the mafia. But yeah, let's go do that. Fontano, who eventually broke down and confessed to the murder, said that he did it out of fear for his own life. So as I said, they pretty much said, like, hey, either you die or he dies. Which one do you want to happen? New York police were able to use Fontano's confession and his assistance to set up and arrest Magadino. While Malazzo was implicated in the murder, he was never actually arrested, and he was able to flee New York and head for Detroit to set up a new base of operations there with other Castella Marisi associates. And in later years, he would work closely with friends of Magadino, who was eventually removed from the pending Kayotso case because there was no direct evidence linking Magadino to the murder, the same reason that Malazzo was never pursued for the killing. They could only prove that they were in the planning stage, but they were like, yeah, we planned it, but we never did it. We never took any action. I don't know who did it. And there really wasn't anything that the cops could do about it. So Magadino headed to Buffalo... Malazzo headed to Detroit, and there really wasn't anything that the cops could do about it. This all happened in 1921, so it was 1921 when Malazzo left Brooklyn and headed for Detroit. He quickly used his connections to his associates back in New York and to other areas like Chicago to maintain his involvement in the Prohibition-era rackets, you know, bootlegging, illegal alcohol sales, consumption, all of that. It was pretty easy for him to set up even in Detroit. The reason that I said in the beginning that Italian immigrants will come to Brooklyn and just, like, hang around until they hear word of mouth, so he came to Brooklyn, and then when he got into trouble and he had to leave, he axed around, and people were like, oh, there's a pretty decent-sized community of Sicilian immigrants in Detroit. So that's why he headed there. Magadino headed to Buffalo because he was able to lead the family there, but Malazzo, what, he, there can't be two bosses. You know, we already had DiCarlo as the underboss in Buffalo, so Malazzo is like, okay, so where can I go that I can be boss? And they were like, oh, go head for Detroit. So he decided to head for Detroit and try to be the boss over in that area. Detroit had a large Sicilian immigrant population. It wasn't as big as New York, but it was large enough that they had a decent amount of people around them. And the area was one of the East Coast's bootlegging hubs. And a lot of crime groups got involved in rackets there. So he thought it would be a really good idea to head there. One of the most famous hubs was known as the Purple Gang, and they were a Jewish gang. At the time of Malazzo's arrival in Motor City, the Purple Gang controlled a lot of the liquor smuggling within the Detroit area. Malazzo quickly established himself as a leading mafioso with very important and influential connections within the American Mafia, and considering that Malazzo had previously operated in New York, Wherever you go outside of New York, you automatically have that respect, especially since New York is the American Mafia's base of power, and the most powerful and influential of the Sicilian Mafia bosses are from New York, and most of the families are located there as well. So when you leave and they're like, oh, where are you from? And you say New York, like, it's instantly like, oh, shit, okay, cool. Like, you're probably somebody very powerful, and you just gain instant respect. Once Malazzo established himself as one of the leaders of the Castella Marisi clan back in New York and aligned himself with Salvatore singing Sam Catalanote, the local president of the Union Siciliana and the leading Sicilian mafia boss in Detroit's Italian underworld, things started to move for him. He quickly started to gain considerable respect and influence in Detroit, and he did that by his actions in Detroit. It wasn't just handed to him because he was from New York. You know, he got respect because he was from New York, 
But once he had some time spent in Detroit, he started to gain a reputation for what he was doing there. Detroit's underworld was extremely dangerous, and he came to be known as an advisor to various mafia leaders and a mediator of business disputes. And he was just able to settle any conflicts in the underworld, even though it was a very dangerous underworld, even though there was a lot of wars going on at the time, there's a lot of issues in the underworld, he was able to establish himself as a very good mediator and a peacekeeper. That's why he came to be known as the peacemaker. There are a lot of conflicting accounts as to exactly when Malazzo arrived in Detroit, but I don't really think it matters that much. He may have stopped in other cities with other Castella Marisi clans, like Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and even California. When he was doing that, he was able to kind of view his criminal and business opportunities in those areas, because even from New York, he was creating these businesses and everything and putting them in California, in Pittsburgh, but he never left New York. So when he's traveling, he's able to stop off in these locations and see his businesses and see all of the stuff that he had set up there along the way. But then he just continued traveling to Detroit because that was ultimately his destination. It was the early 1920s when he started working with Sam Catalanote. So we know that that's the very latest that he could have arrived in Detroit. And they developed a really close working relationship with each other. And since Catalanote was such an important and powerful mafia leader, it really benefited Malazzo to form such a strong relationship with him. Catalanote had taken over the remnants of the old Gianola gang, and he was recognized as Detroit's mafia godfather who was able to align himself with various mafia factions within the Detroit underworld into a cohesive unit or group that controlled bootlegging operations, gambling, narcotics, prostitution, and any other criminal rackets that were going on in the area. In other words, pretty much what Luciano did in New York by taking multiple gangs that were like kind of all over the place and turning them into a cohesive criminal empire, that's what Catalanote was able to do, but he did it in Detroit. Catalanote's peace treaty was known as the Pascusi Combine, which operated without much conflict. There wasn't a lot of bloody battles going on the way that it had in the past because Catalanote established a peace treaty. He was like, listen, we don't want to be at war. We don't want to be hitting the mattresses. We don't want to be killing each other. We're going to put in place a peace treaty and everybody is going to abide by it. Everybody's going to get their own territory, they're going to get their own income, and as long as everybody abides by it, nobody's going to be fighting. And everybody did. Everybody abided by it because nobody wanted to go to war, and it worked out really well under his leadership. Eventually, with the help of Malazzo's mediating skills and two influential mafiosi, who had kept the peace within the Detroit's Italian underworld, they were able to mentor and advise Detroit's future mafia bosses so that they could lead the organization into the next era. So not only did he create peace and stability for the time that he was the boss, he would advise and just kind of teach the new bosses how to do what he did so that when they stepped in, it wouldn't start a power vacuum. It wouldn't start a war. Everybody could just continue with the peace forever. Like, there still to this day isn't any wars or anything going on. Catalanote died on February 14th, 1930. He died at his home in Gross Point after he had been sick for a while. He had pneumonia and he experienced complications from that illness that led to him dying. He passed away on his 36th birthday, so even though he had been sick for a while, nobody expected this poor man to die at such a young age. And it came as a huge shock to the entire community, because he was really, really well-loved in the area. So a lot of people took his death really hard. I wonder if it's like a curse or something. The mafia has to know, like, okay, Valentine's Day is coming up, 
Something really terrible is about to happen. Something terrible happens every single year to the mafia. So, like, I bet you they're they're sitting around like, oh, wonder who's going to go this year because something horrific is going to happen on this Valentine's Day. His funeral was held on February 17th at the Church of the Most Holy Family, which is kind of surprising because a lot of times churches won't allow a funeral or a mass or anything for any members of the mafia, so I'm happy that this church allowed him to have a service. The procession was more than a half a mile long, consisted of over 200 cars, and cost around $20,000, which would be about $356,000 in 2022, after a 1,682% inflation rate over those 92 years. He was buried at Mount Olivet Cemetery in Detroit. After Catalan Note passed away, Malazzo stepped into the position of boss immediately. And he did that so as to avoid any kind of power vacuum that would lead to a war in the area. Since he had been so close to Catalan Note, everybody in Detroit's underworld, they accepted it pretty easily. It was just kind of a given. Like, they heard that Catalanote died, and they were sad, but they didn't even wonder who was going to be the next boss. So, Malazzo took over control of the family on February 14th, 1930, the same day that Catalanote died, and he had a very, very short reign, but he didn't know that at the time. At the time, he thought he would be boss for the next 30 years, and so did the rest of the Detroit underworld. It was well known that Malazzo was a very close associate of the East Side Gang, which was led by Angelo Mele, William Black Bill Toco, and Joseph Joe Uno Zarilli, who took over and led the East Side Mob, which was the remnants of the former Gianola Gang, the Vitali Bosco Gang, and eventually became the first three leaders of the modern Detroit Partnership, which was also known as the Detroit Combination or the Zerilli Crime Family. Malazzo also had a very close working relationship with other leaders of Detroit Mafia factions, including the Down River Gang, which was led by brothers Thomas Yanni and Peter Licavoli and their cousins, the brothers Joseph Joe Misery and Leo Lips Moshery, one of the more formidable mafia factions within Detroit, whose members would become members of the Detroit Partnership's highest levels. There was the West Side Mob, which was the remnants of Sam Catalanote's faction, Wyandot area boss Joseph Joe the Beer Baron Toko, and the La Mer Gang, led by Chester Big Chet La Mer of the Hamtramck area. And those weren't rival gangs, but they weren't friend gangs. They were just gangs that were like in the area. They didn't have any beef, but they just weren't the closest. Obviously, Sam Catalanote's faction, they're gonna have some kind of friendship because Sam Catalanote is obviously Salvatore Catalanote's brother, so they're gonna, you know, at least be friendly. But they're just not the gangs that, like, most closely worked with Malazzo's gang. Malazzo, a member of Detroit's Castella Marisi clan and a senior member of the clan nationwide, found himself embroiled in a growing mafia dispute in Chicago that would spread to every American city where the Castella Marisi clan had a presence, which is all over America. By the mid to late 1920s, the various Castella Marisi clans had maintained a presence in some of the most prominent and well-known American cities with large Sicilian communities, such as New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, Buffalo, and had grown into a really powerful crime family, and all of those families now led, or at the very least rivaled, any Italian crime group within the city in which it operated, including Detroit. Malazzo had become sort of a national counselor within his mafia group because he was frequently called upon to mediate any kind of mafia disputes in other cities. He found himself indirectly involved in a dangerous dispute within Chicago's Italian underworld 
that involved a fellow Castello Marisi gangster and the city's leading Italian gangster who wasn't even Sicilian. Giuseppe Joe Aiello, the leader of Chicago's Castello Marisi clan, was battling with Al Capone and his Capone gang, which would later come to be known as the Chicago Outfit, for control of various Prohibition-era rackets, such as bootlegging, gambling, you know the whole drill, in south side of Chicago's Little Italy. When three of the six Jenna brothers were gunned down in 1925, Joe Aiello took over the area of Chicago that had previously been ruled by the Jenna brothers gang. Because the community's Italian residents and their winemaking expertise were being used to operate homemade liquor distilleries that were set up in apartment complexes all over the area, Al Capone's organization coveted this territory. They really wanted it. And it dominated Chicago's home distillery rackets. Another point of contention within the Chicago Mafia was that previously, both Joe Aiello and Al Capone had held influence in the local chapter of the Union Siciliana, but in the spring of 1929, Joe Aiello had become the Union's leader following the killing of Giuseppe Joseph Hoptoad Giunta, the Union's previous leader, who Al Capone personally battered to death for betraying him. Because Al Capone was of Neapolitan ancestry, the Sicilian-born Aiello had the upper hand and he was able to thwart any of Capone's repeated attempts to take over the Sicilian-run organization by supporting Sicilian-born gangsters to lead it. As a Sicilian and fellow Castella Marisi, Gaspar Malazzo supported Joe Aiello in his bid to eliminate the Neapolitan Al Capone, being that Joe Aiello was the recognized Sicilian boss in the city of Chicago. But even with Aiello aligning with the forces of George Bugs Moran and his Irish Northside gang, Capone still held the upper hand overall. Even with a fair-sized criminal organization that held around 100 to 150 men and many associates, Joe Aiello, really, he wasn't a match for Al Capone. Capone led a criminal organization of three to 400 men, hundreds of associates, and he controlled virtually all the law enforcement and political connections within the city. New York Mafia boss Giuseppe Joe the Boss Masseria, the most powerful mafia boss in America, and a Capone ally, asked Malazzo to stop supporting Aiello and proposed an alliance between themselves if Malazzo would set up Aiello for assassination. When Masseria brought that proposition to Malazzo, Malazzo flat out refused Masseria's offer. And he was really deeply offended by his request. Malazzo was a real one. He was a ride or die for his boys and Aiello was a fellow Castella Marisi native, which we all know is the most important thing about you, where you were born in Italy. Aiello was born in the same area as Malazzo, and that made him better than Capone by default, point blank period. And within the Italian mafia, a perceived insult of that nature did nothing but strengthen Malazzo's resolve to support his friend Aiello, who had the backing of the Castella Marisi clan leaders in New York, Philadelphia, and Buffalo. Joe Masseria was New York's self-proclaimed boss of bosses, and he hailed from Memphi, Italy, which is in Sicily. It's definitely in northern Sicily, but where it would take you 10 hours to get to Naples, it would only take you 50 minutes to get to Castello Mare del Golfo. So I don't really know why Masseria supported Capone over Aiello in the first place. Masseria hailed from the same area as Aiello. Usually, Sicilians stick together and support one another, but Masseria was clearly not about that life. He was not a ride or die for his fellow Sicilians. See, Naples, where Capone is from, is a little bit south of Rome, and it's more in like the upper ankle of the Italian boot than in the little soccer ball that the boot is kicking that is Sicily. Masseria was humiliated by Malazzo's refusal, and he quickly realized that Malazzo was not only supporting Aiello in Chicago, 
but also Masseria's main rival in New York, Salvatore Maranzano. Malazzo's fellow Castella Marisi were Masseria's greatest threat to his position of power within the New York Mafia, which held among it Maranzano. The Malazzo Maranzano alliance greatly increased Masseria's determination to eliminate a lot of Castella Marisi mafiosi, including Malazzo, Maranzano, Aiello, and Malazzo's old friend and cousin, Stefano Magadino, in Buffalo. Masseria started hatching a plan to assassinate Malazzo and Magadino, the head of the major Western New York crime family, who Masseria believed was conspiring with Malazzo. Masseria's first action against Gaspar Malazzo was to back Caesar Chester Lemaire. With the death of Sam Catalanote, a top Detroit Mafia boss in the early 1930s, the Detroit Mafia was once again experiencing unrest, rivalry, and conflict. The Italian underworld in Detroit had gone through its own bloody power struggles in the mid to late 1910s. The alliance and truce that Catalanote and Milazzo had helped to establish over the previous few years were now beginning to fall apart. And one of the most explosive disputes that had already resulted in some violence was between the East Side and West Side mobs. Angelo Mele, the leader of the East Side mob, had received a message that the West Side mob leader, Chet Lemaire, was requesting a meeting to discuss mafia affairs and perhaps put an end to the feud. Mele, however, was a shrewd man and knew that it was not safe to meet with Lemaire. Malazzo was a highly regarded member of the Detroit Mafia, and he was well known for his mediation abilities. So Mele reasoned that he could send Malazzo in his place and Lemaire would not take it personally because he would understand how Malazzo would be seen as the only person who could mediate this dispute on his behalf. Malazzo agreed when Mele asked him to represent him at the meeting. What was not known at the time to Malazzo and to Mele was that the powerful New York mafia boss Joe Masseria had begun to support Chet Lemaire in his bid to take over the Detroit Mafia, which was something that would not please Malazzo, who was a close associate of Angelo Mele and his two right-hand men, Joe Zarilli and Bill Tocco. Even though it's kind of unknown for sure whether Malazzo was aware of Masseria backing Lemaire, it's highly unlikely that he was aware that Masseria had been warned by someone, possibly even a member of his own Detroit Mafia, that Malazzo and Magadino were planning to kill him. Alternatively, Masseria may have been simply just using that as a pretext to attack the two Castella Marisi Mafia bosses because of his own agenda. Either way, Malazzo agreed to Mele's request that he accompany Le Maire to the sit-down on his behalf. Because Mele was of the opinion that Le Maire wouldn't risk starting a war by assassinating a Mafia boss while enjoying his respect and support. On May 31st, 1930, Gaspar the Peacemaker Malazzo and Sam Sasa Perino, his right-hand man and driver, had attended the meeting at the Werner Highway Fish Market in Detroit in place of Angelo Mele and his associates. While he was waiting for Le Maire or his representatives, he really wasn't sure who was going to show up, but he knew someone was going to show up on behalf of Le Maire, Malazzo and Perino took their seats and they started to eat lunch. Without any comment or anything, two gunmen leaped out and unleashed a barrage of shotgun bullets that hit Malazzo in the head and killed him instantly. Perino was hit in the chest, abdomen, and arm, and he died shortly after. Gaspar Malazzo was a low-key and very reserved mafia leader who was highly respected by his fellow mafiosi. He died at the age of 43 years old, with only three investigations having ever been launched against him for robbery and grand larceny and no convictions. He had never gotten found guilty. The reaction to the murder of Gaspar Malazzo was shock and outrage. The men who were closely aligned with Malazzo, such as Mele, Toko, and Zarilli, 
had called for vengeance and were determined to eliminate Le Maire and his associates for such a disrespectful and disgraceful attack on a man who had been a friend to all that knew him, even Le Maire, whose safety in other mafia territories outside of Detroit had been assured by Malazzo himself with one phone call on many occasions. So they're pissed. They're mad. Some people speculate that Chet Lemaire had become the top boss in Detroit, but upon Malazzo's death, his closest associates and supporters unleashed a wave of violence upon the Lemaire faction that led to 14 deaths in only a year. Lemaire himself would be betrayed and killed by his own men less than a year after Malazzo's killing. A lot of organized crime historians believe that Malazzo's murder started the bloody Castella Marisi war in New York City between Joe the Boss Masseria and Malazzo's associate, Salvatore Maranzano. A lot of other people dispute that with the fact that Maranzano associate and ally Gaetano Tommy Reina was killed in New York on Masseria's orders three months prior to Malazzo's killing. And that is what launched the Castella Marisi War. But it's widely believed or considered to be the first Bali within the National Mafia War that lasted from 1930 to 1931, being that Malazzo and Perino were the first Castella Marisi casualties of the war, and that it was a huge insult against the Castella Marisi that cemented their resolve and motivated them to go on in the war against Joe the Boss Masseria. In 1999, Malazzo was portrayed by Ralph Santo Stefano in a television movie. So that is all I have for this organized crime giant, Gaspar Malazzo. So what did you think of the Gaspar Malazzo story? Do you believe that he was as powerful and intelligent as he was made out to be? Or do you think that his mediating capacity was exaggerated by history? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks so much for watching. Join me next week as I delve into the lives and legacies of some of the most fascinating and infamous mafia figures in history. And please don't forget to like, share, subscribe, follow, do all the things. And I'll see you next week. Bye. <laughs>